Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, I guess, now, or almost afternoon. Uh, thank you all for joining us today at our fifth Lunch and Learn of uh, this year. We are so excited to have you all. We is Downtown Lafayette Unlimited uh, and Downtown Development Authority. I see a lot of friendly faces in the room who regularly attend our Lunch and Learns, but also some new faces. It's really awesome that each time we gather, we bring on new people who want to get engaged in downtown, learn about what's going on in the downtown environment, and, uh, and leave with new friends and new, uh, new colleagues. So thank you for everyone uh, for being here today. I'd like to uh, thank our presenting sponsor, Keen Miller, who's sitting at our head table uh, today. I'm gonna introduce one of their representatives in just a couple of minutes, but we really appreciate Keen Miller's investment in this Lunch and Learn DLU as a whole and in downtown Lafayette, um, a really uh, well-renowned international law firm that we are excited uh, decides to office in downtown Lafayette. This Lunch and Learn is also supported by Evangeline Maid, uh, and we are so grateful for, again, their investment for over 100 years in the downtown area uh, and all that they do for our community. Our host sponsor today is the Downtown Convention Center, which is where you are sitting. I heard from so many of you today, wow, I've never been here before. This is so nice. Uh, and Jamie and I were talking, Jamie from BBR and I were talking about all the natural light in here. So like, thank you Downtown Convention Center for giving us some natural light while we have uh, a lunch and learn. Uh, you've all gotten lunch now from our good friend Reggie. Uh, Reggie works with us a lot at Downtown Alive. He has um, a food truck, Reggie Soul Food, but you got to enjoy his catering lunch today. Reggie, great to have you. Thanks for being here today. Oh yeah, let's give him a little hand. I love that. Um, we are going to talk about some upcoming events at the end of the Lunch and Learn, so make sure you stick around after you get all educated by Dr. Wagner uh, so that you can learn how you can next get involved with DLU. But for now, I want to introduce Ambrose Stearns with Keen Miller. He's an associate in the Lafayette office, which Keen Miller uh, offices in the Chase Tower downtown, and he practices on offshore energy and marine litigation, general causality lit litigation, business and corporate law, and food and beverage law, which is so interesting. We've got to talk more about that, Ambrose. Um, he is an active member of Lafayette and the Louisiana State Bar Association and the greater Lafayette community. We are so fortunate that Ambrose is a board member of Downtown Lafayette Unlimited, where he helps to organize and promote sp public spaces and events to support Lafayette's community and businesses. I see a couple of his fellow uh, committee members on the membership committee. Uh, Ambrose, we're so fortunate to have you, an award-winning attorney. Um, he's listed in Louisiana Super Lawyers as a rising star for 2023 and in Acadiana Profile as a top 2023 lawyer. Um, we love having you around, Ambrose, and I'm so excited to give you the chance today to introduce Dr. Wagner. Ambrose, come take it away. Thank you, Anita, for the introduction. I'd like to welcome everyone to the 2023 Mid-Year Economic Update with Dr. Gary Wagner. Um, and I'd like to thank Downtown Lafayette Unlimited for hosting the event, along with many other wonderful events that they put on throughout the year and do such a great job. Um, on behalf of Keen Miller, we're proud to sponsor this event. Our office is located in Downtown Lafayette, so we directly benefit from all the hard work that DLU has done to make it safe, beautiful, and flourish. Keen Miller's Lafayette trajectory mirrors that of downtown which is to say an upward trajectory. Our Lafayette office has tripled in the number of attorneys in the past three years, and we're expecting more growth. We now have the resources to help businesses and individuals with a full scope of legal services, including business and real estate transactions, labor and employment, tax, intellectual property and data security, and a variety of commercial litigation. I'm now honored to introduce Dr. Gary Wagner, Acadiana Business Economist Endowed Chair at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. In this role, he closely monitors the region's economic environment, conducts research and analysis, and engages with external stakeholders on behalf of the Moody College of Business and the University. His research interests range, range from regional eco economics to state and local public finance issues with a particular focus on tax structures and economic development, borrowing costs, and pension systems. Dr. Wagner has also authored dozens of professional articles and reports on regional and national economic conditions. Just like you, I'm looking forward to hear what Dr. Wagner has to say 
about the future of our Acadiana region. So please help me welcome Dr. Wagner to the stage. Okay, so good afternoon. It's nice to be with you. I want to thank Anita for the invitation. I noticed uh, looking and making the presentation for this year that it was almost exactly a year ago that I was here talking to DDA for a luncheon as well. So what I want to do is give you an update on uh, regional economic conditions, talk about some issues that I'm seeing, talk about some things that I think are very positive for the region, some things that I think we can do a little bit better in the region. Uh, but I also want to point out the information here is pretty dense. I'm going to cover some of it very quickly. I'm happy to make the slides available to anybody that's interested. I'm pretty easy to track down. You can Google my name and UL and my email address pops right up. Uh, if you have any questions after the presentation, feel free to email them. Also, I think it's more informative and more interesting from my perspective if it's more of a discussion-based conversation. So feel free to jump in at any time as I'm going along and feel free to ask any questions about something that you might have seen in the news that is just not part of the presentation because part of it is, you know, I've got only so much I can talk about. I want to try to hit the major themes, but if you've got something on your mind, feel free to chime in. So first I want to give you uh, an update on current economic conditions mainly talk about a little bit with inflation in the national scene because I think it's going to dictate what's happening to the regional economy. I know we all care about what's happening locally, but it's often hard to deviate from those national headwinds, so I want to talk a little bit about that. I want to talk about labor markets and particularly out-migration in the region, how we compare in Lafayette to Louisiana as a whole and what that means from the standpoint of talent, attraction, and retention, because I think that's going to be a key issue for the region, and it still is a key issue for the region. Then I'll talk about housing affordability, which is some new information I've been looking at that I haven't talked about publicly before, so you get to see it for the first time. And then lastly, I'm going to actually talk about Taylor Swift if we have time. <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, and no, I don't know anything about Taylor Swift. I don't have any kids. And in fact, I told my wife this morning I was going to mentioned something about Taylor Swift and she looked at me and said, you don't know anything about Taylor Swift. <laughs> so first thing I want to talk about is starting off with just the national economy. So this is showing you monthly net job growth for the U.S. as a whole, going back over the last couple of years. So different years are shaded in different colors. And you can see in 2023, we've been averaging about 287,000 jobs a month for the U.S. economy as a whole. So that's a very robust number. The labor market nationally and locally is very strong. Uh, the reason why I wanted to point this out is normally a good number for the national economy is around 175,000 jobs. So we're still gaining jobs at a very, very solid pace. I think one thing also that's not highlighted in the chart is there's a lot of underlying churn in the economy. So the U.S. economy might gain 200,000 jobs a month, but we lose about 3 million jobs a month and we gain about 3.2, so that's that net difference. But this is a key economic indicator that the Federal Reserve is paying attention to when it comes to inflation, which is one of the reasons why I want to talk about this. They're concerned about labor markets, how tight labor markets are, and what that might be doing to fuel inflation. So getting more local, this is what we're seeing in Lafayette. So this is month-to-month -month job growth for the region. You can see the pre-pandemic average is about 180 jobs. We're at 350 so far in 2023 for the average. If you go back over the last 12 months, the Lafayette region is outperforming every other MSA in the state in terms of job growth. So Lafayette, the market has been extremely tight. The labor market's tight. I'll talk more about that later. But in my view, this is probably the best economic indicator of how overall the region is performing, which is looking at monthly payroll job numbers. So where these come from, if you want to nerd out for just a second. So this is for the MSA. So the MSA is the five parish region. It's a metropolitan statistical area. That's what MSA count stands for. So this is surveys of businesses and the number of people that are on the payroll. So this is the largest employer survey that we have. It's done nationally. And so it's the most reliable indicators of what's happening in the labor market. And as I mentioned, we're seeing really strong growth around Lafayette. We're also seeing very strong growth around Louisiana as a whole. But compared to all the other regions, Lafayette has done extremely well over the last 12 months. 
It's going to be a long talk. I'll be done quickly if I don't have any questions here. So, what was the spike in April? So the, uh, the spike in April, that I don't know exactly which sector that was. I didn't look. Okay. One of the things you want to think about, though, with monthly numbers, again, kind of digging into the weeds, don't put, any much, don't put too much attention to any one month's number because they do bounce around a little bit. The way that these are actually calculated, so this will explain why they bounce around. It's, the, it's counting the number of people that are on the payroll the second week of the month. So for some particular month, which is a big issue in Louisiana if you have, say, a hurricane that comes through, and that reduces the number of people that are just employed at that period, it really shows up in the data, and then a month later it's gone. So this is one of the reasons why I tend to look at this kind of longer period. So if you look over the last 12 months, you get a good sense of what's been happening on average in the region. So rooftops in what sense you mean? New residential construction. Uh, I don't have any numbers on new residential construction off the top of my head. Uh, so I know the building permits that we're seeing in the region are about our five-year average. So we're building about the same average number of houses we have over the last five years. That's the only number that's off the top of my head. Um, I have all of the housing information for the region, but I didn't look at all of it for this particular presentation. So I showed this chart last year, and I want to show it again. I think it's a good way of getting a sense of kind of what the pandemic did to the U.S. economy, what it did to the state, what it did to the region, and how we're recovering. So I know there's a lot of information on here and a lot of numbers, but I can explain it pretty quickly. If you look down on the left, that's the percentage loss in jobs due to the pandemic. And so that line is for the U.S. And you can see it goes down to almost 15%, which means the U.S. economy lost almost 15% of its jobs because of the pandemic. To put a number in perspective that you know, all of you are old enough to remember, the 2008 recession, which was a pretty bad recession, we lost about 6.3% of our jobs nationally, so twice as bad. And then across the top is the number of months it takes to get back over zero. So how quickly did the economy recover? And you can see we crossed zero at about 25 months, right? and we're now 3% higher, which means we now have nationally 3% more people working than we had before the pandemic. So if you look at Louisiana, very similar experience. So we lost about 15% of our jobs, but we're still one and a half percent below where we were statewide. If you look at Lafayette, so we're almost back. So about half a percent. So I think probably in a couple months, the Lafayette region is gonna end up gaining back all of the jobs that were lost from the pandemic. So we're, we're again, we're not the fastest growing region in the state over this whole period over the last couple of years, but we're in the top three. So uh, the areas that have been struggling the most, probably not surprising to a lot of you, would be you know, Homa and Lake Charles are, are really lagging behind. The areas that are really growing fast in the state, you know, Lafayette and Alexandria are kind of the two regions right now that are leading the way. So the outlook for the near term, though, is pretty favorable. So this is GDP growth for the US economy. So those blue bars are growth that we've actually had. You can see we're growing about 2%, 2.2%, which is pretty close to our historical average. In the next quarter, the outlook is for 2.4%. So this is an estimate from the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. So it's a leading indicator about where the economy is heading. So the outlook over the next few months is very positive. I will say, uh, some of you may know this, some of you may not. I do a quarterly report on economic activity in Louisiana and all of the metro areas. Uh, that is freely available online. You can go to the Moody College of Business and sign up. I didn't include my projections for Lafayette here because the national outlook has improved substantially over the last three months. My next report is gonna come out at the end of August, and so I think the outlook is gonna be significantly better at the end of August than it was in May. So I didn't wanna show you the May numbers because I think the outlook is actually improving. But in August, I'll release some new information over the next four quarters, and I think we're probably likely to see a pretty nice uptick in growth in the region. So one area, of course, where we're seeing some slowdowns is housing markets. I'm sure all of you are aware of that. I'll talk a little bit about housing markets, and I'm going to tie in some inflation and talk about some other pieces. But this is just showing you year over year home price growth for the U.S., which is in green, Louisiana is in, I guess that's red, Lafayette's in blue, uh, and this is quarterly data, 
and it's including not just prices of homes that sold, but also refinances. So it's the broadest measure of housing prices that we have. And you can see, if you go back to say, the second quarter of 2022, right in the middle of the chart, I mean, the US was experiencing year over year home price growth of 20%. Right? A lot of that was really fueled by what was happening out in the Pacific Northwest, where they were seeing home price growth you know, of 30, 35% year over year. But even in Lafayette, we were almost at 15%. So the historical norm in our area is somewhere around three to four percent. So we were seeing housing price growth that was, you know, three to four to five times higher than normal. And in fact, the way I would describe it is what we saw over the last two years is a once in a generation housing market. I know at one point in time uh, in 2021, this, this number still just blows my mind. I, I repeat it all the time. The, 50% of homes that were listed for sale in Lafayette were under contract in less than three days. I mean, 50% in less than three days. And so just an amazing number. So we're seeing the housing market cool, but what I mean by that is we're gonna see a return, I think, to something that looks more normal for the region. So I don't think this is going to be a housing market correction like we saw in 2008. I think for us, it's going to look like 2012, 2013, 2014. It may feel like a significant correction because of the way the market's been the last couple of years. But I think we're still going to see positive growth. And again, here's more indication of kind of housing markets slowing. So this is, these are the nine metro areas around Louisiana. <coughs> Lafayette's right in the middle. And it's just looking at year over year change in list prices. So you can see in, in Lafayette, it's just minus 9%. That doesn't mean that housing prices are falling, right? It means that list prices are, are lower than they were the year before, but housing prices are still going up. So I think we're gonna see probably home price growth more in the three to 4% range over the next couple of years. The double digit numbers are probably long behind us. And again, a lot of that has been due to the interest rate environment, the fact that you know, mortgage rates are now upwards of 6.8, you know, 6.9%. So also with the housing market, I mean, it's still a good position for sellers, right? So that dotted line there is giving you the median days on market for residential properties in the Lafayette MSA. So you can see pre-pandemic average is about 106 days. So, you know, three and a half months or so. And you can see it dip down in early 2022 to somewhere around 25 days. So now we're at about 47 days on market. So the inventory levels still haven't recovered from COVID. And what happened here and what happened nationally with housing markets is as soon as the pandemic hit, the number of properties that were for sale decreased substantially. They've gradually been coming back. And what happened is, you know, you have fewer houses available, you still have buyers. That's what led to the big increase in prices. We're starting to see some of these uh, inventory levels return to normal, but they're still not close to where they were pre-pandemic. So normally we would have an inventory of somewhere around five to six months of housing, and we're about two and a half. So we're about half the inventory level that we normally have. <clears throat> Any questions? Just like teaching class. <laughs> so I will assume you understand everything. So the last thing I want to do is just show you one chart about inflation. I know there's a lot going on, a lot of numbers. I can explain it to you pretty easily and then tie into some more uh, interesting things I think about housing prices and migration in the region. But I think the outlook has improved, I think, for a couple of reasons. The inflation numbers are looking a lot better. So we are now starting to see some signs. I think that inflation is cooling off. I'm gonna be paying close attention to these numbers over the next few months. And so you might think, why does it matter? because it means the Federal Reserve is very likely to now pause the interest rate increases. So I think, I wouldn't be surprised if there's one additional increase this year. I would be really surprised if there's more than one additional increase. And I would say I'm basically 50-50 on whether there's one. I think at this point they may just go into a long pause and see what's going to happen. But the only thing you need to pay attention to is I'm highlighting in red. So that red bar is showing you Inflation measured over the last 12 months. That line is a 2%. That's the Federal Reserve's target rate for inflation. So if you look at the red bar, it's almost at 4. So measuring inflation over the last 12 months is at 4%. Well, the blue bar is measuring it over the last 6 months. Well, that's just over 4%. 
the yellow bar is measuring it over the last three months, and it's down to just over 2%. And then that, I guess, really light, I don't know what the color that is, I'll call it gray. That the gray bar is measuring inflation over just the last month, and that's below 2%. So in other words, the fact that those things are kind of moving down means that over the, the more recent data, we're seeing slower and slower and slower inflation. So we're getting closer to that target, and I think what we're going to see is for the first time uh, in, in recent years is the Federal Reserve is likely going to pause raising interest rates. So I think that also is going to help keep the economy moving along. Now I want to talk a little bit about labor markets and kind of tie this into Labor markets being very tight, talent, attraction, retention. I know there's a lot going on in this chart as well, but look at the blue line. So this is for Louisiana. So it's the number of job openings per unemployed people. And this goes all the way back to 2000. It's as far back as the data go. And you can see when that number is over one, that means you have more job openings than you do unemployed people. And right now, statewide, we have two job openings per unemployed people. And you can see it's at a historic high. In fact, I was optimistic a couple months ago that it might turn and see some signs that the labor market was getting a little bit softer. That hasn't happened. In fact, it's still very tight in Louisiana. It's still very tight nationally. And this is one of the reasons we're still seeing very robust job growth. So the plus side is for people who are looking for work, it's a great time to enter the labor force. It also means it's very difficult to retain talent because now all of a sudden it's a great opportunity for people to move. So you see some of that, but there's a couple reasons why we're seeing the labor market being really, really tight, and those are important issues that I want to hit on. Yes? When you say unemployed persons, do you mean those seeking or like from a workforce participation rate? So saying unemployed, that's a great question. So the question was about um, somebody who's unemployed versus a, what we would call the labor force. And so basically, if you are counted as being unemployed, that means that you are actively seeking a job. Now, you could also be willing and able to work, but not actively seeking a job. And I'll talk about that in just a second. And those are people that are not in the labor force. So one of the key things about, so see a hand go up there? Is that what, I'd like to be that person too, but you know, unfortunately, I have, to, I have bills to pay too. Um, so I think one thing that's important is when you think about, this is a, it's a big issue that's going on now. Here it's a big issue that's happening nationally, looking at the labor force, because in some of these numbers, the labor force is basically the fraction of the population who is working or actively looking for work. So it's not always everybody who has a job, but you have to be actively looking for work. And we've seen a big significant change nationally and also locally as well, and that's right here. So this kind of ties back in. This is showing you the fraction of the population. This is national data. So I don't have this for Louisiana, it doesn't exist. I've estimated it. But this is the fraction of the population who is not part of the labor force and says that they don't want a job. So that would be this young lady right here. Right here. But here's what I wanted to point out. So go back to 2008, right? You see that number's around 26%. We see a pretty big jump up during the pandemic. Those gray bars are when we had recessions, the big gray bars. And you can see it's almost at 30%. So you might think, eh, it increased from 26 to 30%. That's a 4% increase on 330 million people. That's a lot of people now who dropped out of the labor force and haven't come back. And I don't know if anybody knows why they haven't come back. And in fact, in Lafayette, in Louisiana, in Louisiana, uh, my current estimate is we have 40,000 people in the state who were working pre-COVID who are now just completely out of the labor force, which means they're not in the unemployment rate numbers because they're not part of the labor force. And that's one of the reasons why the unemployment rate numbers are at historic lows. Because all of a sudden, if you added all those people back in, the unemployment rate would be higher. So from my perspective, at least now, the unemployment rate is not the best indicator of where the economy is heading because of the fact that we had so many people drop out. Now, I can give you a couple bits of information about what's going on here. Um, 
And I mentioned this at one point in the past to a group I spoke to, and then it, I just said because I thought it was funny, and then it got picked up by the media and went all over the place. So about half of those people who dropped out of the labor force, and this is true in Lafayette too, and for our, our metro area, about half of those people are unmarried men under the age of 40. Right? Those are prime people to be in the labor force. It's been happening all around the country. We're seeing a lot. It's, it's more so, more pronounced with men than with women. Now, we don't know exactly what people are doing or why they're out of the labor force, but there is something called the American Time Use Survey. And so when you think, what are these people doing? Well, I can tell you what those people self-report. So those people, mainly the under 40 men, they self-report, this is what got picked up by the media, I'm not making this up, they self-report playing video games seven hours a day. I, I'm not making that up. So, I mean, one of the things I was jokingly saying is if we wanna, maybe if you wanna attract and retain some talent, maybe you, you know, the old, the, the way old days where you had the little smoking break, maybe you have the little gaming break over and put a room in the side and that will attract some people, but, uh, it, it's an issue, it's an, the reason why it's an issue is, right, you think about, to me, the greatest resource we have for the economy is people, right? And so you're taking a big chunk of who could be productive people, and now they're not in the labor force. And so one of the reasons that labor markets are very tight is you have all of these people who previously before COVID were working, and now they're not. And so finding out why that's happening is a bit of a conundrum. Magnus first, but I have questions too. <laughs> we have the same question. Because uh, I'm curious in that, of like how much are we able to track how many people took early retirement after, since a lot of it was over, and any of the efforts in that of trying to improve the back of the workforce? It sounds like a lot of them are not coming back in. They're not. So what, what initially happened during COVID, so the question was about uh, individuals retiring and early retiring. What we saw during the early days of the pandemic is basically people who were employed stayed employed. And older workers stayed employed, probably because there was a lot of uncertainty. And as soon as the uncertainty started to go away, then all of a sudden those retirement rates started ticking back up to normal. So they're certainly not coming back into the labor force. I think another issue that's really, well, let me get this other question, then I'll pivot it back. These 30% who are not in the labor force, and I'm not just talking about the dudes playing games all day, but they're on the line. Are they collecting so, yeah, right, well, I, well I, can, I can only tell, I only looked at the men, unmarried men under the age of 40, because it was a big chunk, right? And so here's what they do, they, they self-report the video games, they also self-report living with an unpartnered adult. So I, Is that mom's basement? That, <laughs> no, it could be mom's basement, it could be somebody else. So, so it seems like somebody's finding, somebody's a lot smarter than I am because they figured out how to get somebody to pay, pay their bills. Uh, but, yes? How does the freelancing So freelancing people are included in this because this, these data are a survey of just households. So there's something called uh, the current population survey. And so the Bureau of Labor Statistics calls people and they say, are you employed? If you're not employed, have you been looking for a job? And if you say, no, I haven't been looking for a job, you might fall into here. But then there are a lot of reasons why people are not looking for a job. So one could be, if you're a full-time student, you're considered exempt. If you're, say, you know, work uh, at home, caring for a family member, you could be exempt. If you're retired, right, you're not part of the labor force. But that big jump there, uh, pre-COVID to post-COVID, is not due to any of those factors. Right? It's not due to all of a sudden more people are full-time students. Uh, more people are now taking care of family members. It's due to a number of people who just dropped out of the labor force and haven't come back. And so that's one of the reasons that the labor markets are so incredibly tight. If a question in the back? Yeah, so I have, every, for the industries in Lafayette, what we've been seeing over the last year is pretty broad-based job growth. 
So we're seeing it across most sectors. Uh, I think the one sector where we're still not seeing a lot of growth is really oil and gas. Uh, it's been pretty stagnant. In fact, for the region, so if you go back to say 2014, you know, in 2014, the metro region had about 25,000 oil and gas jobs. Then, we, because oil prices really plummeted in 2014, that went down to about 12,000, and we're right around that number. So that number has not budged in any meaningful way in the last 10 years. So we have about half the oil and gas jobs today that we had 10 years ago. But this is kind of showing you kind of the metro areas and the labor force around the state. So you can see, you know, in Lafayette, the labor force is actually a little bit bigger post-COVID, 1.3%. But you can look, you see the New Orleans area, Homa, Lake Charles, significant, significant reductions in the number of people who are either employed or seeking employment. And again, the, the main thing I think about from an economic perspective, right, is you've got longer term consequences of it. how do we fuel growth if we don't have people who are in the labor force. I think the other piece of this that often doesn't receive a lot of attention, which, you know, I might be thinking about in an, in an AI world, is the longer you struggle to find talent, the more you're going to look towards automation. And so you see particular situations where, you know, is this an incentive to now uh, be more disruptive than it otherwise would be because firms are going to now look for ways of doing the work, doing it with fewer people. And this is also something unrelated to this, but this is also something that I tend to worry a lot about when we talk about, we hear discussions about very, very large increases in the minimum wage. Because every time you have any of those significant jumps, right, that's an incentive to seek some alternative and to seek alternative through technology. And so I think longer term, this is something that I worry a little bit about, whether or not we're going to see opportunities for those folks to come back into the labor force. Let me see. Okay. So then I want to tie this in with kind of migration. So we've got one thing we're down statewide because people are just not back in the labor force post-COVID. The other thing that's kind of a double whammy for Louisiana not so much for Lafayette, is the out-migration that's been happening. So this is showing you the total out-migration from the state over the last 21 years. So we've lost 273,000 residents over the last 21 years. And you can see the states that are in blue, so Colorado, Texas, Arkansas, Georgia, Florida, those are all states where Louisiana has, on net, lost more than 20,000 people. And in fact, I probably should make Texas black because we've lost 237,000 residents to Texas in the last 20 years. Now, of course, a lot of that was Hurricane Katrina, which I'll show you, but those people never came back. And the second thing is, even if we took out the effects of Hurricane Katrina, we're still losing. And we're losing across a lot of different dimensions. So the states in green there are the states where we're actually gaining people. Right? All the states in blue are the places where we've been losing population. But I think one thing to also point out is if you look at the other states in the South, Louisiana is basically the only state in the South that is on net losing people. So to me, that's a very strong indicator because it's telling you that right, it's like what we call you know, voting with your feet. Where people are making decisions on where to go and they're going other places. So this is showing you, uh, again, just the year-to-year -year breakdown, but it's also showing you educated in terms of college education versus uh, those without a college education. You can see if you look at 2005, 2006, huge, huge losses for the this, this state as a whole, but I want to zero in on just the last 10 years. So I don't know what happened in 2017 here. Uh, I moved here in 2018, so I guess I wasn't the cause of this, but there's a since 2017, a pretty big drop in where people are going. Uh, it's happening not as bad in Lafayette as it's happening statewide. Uh, you're seeing a lot of it. It's not just all the New Orleans region. It's happening in Baton Rouge. We're seeing it all around the state. But we're losing a lot of people to our competitors. Uh, if we look at the Lafayette MSA, so where do people go? So we've lost almost 7,000 people over the last 15 years. So these are two other states, so people who lived in Louisiana, lived in Lafayette one year, and then moved somewhere else. 
So to the extent that the region's gaining population, I haven't looked internally. Uh, there was a nice piece in the paper a few weeks ago about birth rates in Louisiana parishes. You know, some, some of you probably saw that. So I don't know what the numbers look like for Lafayette, but one of the reasons we've gained some population is we're pulling other people from other parts of the state. So we're not pulling people from outside of the state, but we are pulling some people from inside of the state. And you can see, of course, Texas and Florida being the big places there. And if you dig a little deeper, which I just don't have, didn't show it to you, but I have all the data. You know, we're probably not surprising. You, you probably know this. Most of the people who have relocated out of Lafayette have gone to Houston or Dallas. I mean, those are kind of the big markets where we're losing a lot of people. We're also losing a lot to Arkansas. So uh, all those places are essentially attracting uh, our talent. If you look here by education level, so we look a little bit better than most of the other metro regions in the state. Um, you can see we did see a big reduction there in 2021. We saw a big outflow of people in the region. Hopefully that doesn't continue in 2022. But you can see we're, it's not just college educated that we're losing. I mean, statewide, so we lost 270,000 people statewide. You know, 60,000 of those folks were college educated. And the only reason I made that distinction is, you know, what drives growth, and this is something I talked about last year, what really drives growth is innovation. And so having a skilled workforce is something that's really important. And one of the things that is, correlates pretty closely to workforce skill is just education level. It's not a perfect indicator, but it gives you a good sense, and that's why I was breaking that out. Now, Lafayette by age, you know, this is to me is a little concerning as well. So this is a breakdown uh, by age group, and you can see where we're losing a lot, especially in the last couple of years, is really in that 25 to 34 age cohort. The only age cohort where the region has been attracting is a net attractor is 55 and older. So these could be people who are retired and then coming back, who were originally here, what are, you know, the boomerangs. Uh, I mean, one good thing about boomerangs, if they are boomerangs, generally uh, they're pretty well off financially, so they're helping to fuel the community that way, but they're also generally not in the labor force, or a lot less likely to be in the labor force. And I think one thing about the region going forward is, you know, start thinking about factors that are gonna keep this 25 to 34 year old cohort here. Uh, and there are a number of reasons that they may be moving. I don't have a great sense of that, but I do have a sense of one, which is, uh, it's like a little delay here. <clears throat> so it's stealing all my thunder. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about just housing affordability. So this is something I haven't talked about before, so it's relatively new. Um, this is looking at the ratio of median home prices to income at various counties around the country. I know Louisiana has parishes, everybody else has counties, so I'm gonna call them counties for now. And you can see, you know, going out to the West Coast, right, it's very dark blue. The average house price there is more than five times the average income. So we would tend to think about Lafayette, or at least I've heard people think about Lafayette as being very affordable. Now, one caveat I want to say is affordability is not just limited to housing, right? You've got other things, you have energy, you have all these facets, so I'm only capturing one. But I'll tell you, notice Louisiana doesn't really jump out as being a bastion of affordability relative to the rest of the country. The counties that are gray kind of in the middle are counties where there's not enough data to actually calculate this. But if we zero in on the state, you can see the most affordable places to live in Louisiana are North Louisiana, right? The South is comparatively more expensive, and Lafayette is actually, our number is 3.2. So where does that put us? We're in the 75th percentile nationwide. So that means there's only 25% of the counties in the country where housing is more expensive based on income than it is in Lafayette. So it's a relatively expensive place to live. And here's another one to show you. So this is kind of the five parish region and housing affordability over time. You can see going back to say 2000, saw a pretty good reduction from 2000 to 2010. What does that mean? That means housing becoming more affordable. And then you see a big increase there. Basically Lafayette breaks away. And if you 
look at the numbers now, Lafayette is about 20 to 25 percent more expensive than the neighboring parishes. And that's a pretty big gap. It's a pretty big gap. And I think this could be one reason why we're seeing a lot more uh, homes being built outside the parish than inside the parish. Of course, that's just conjecture. I don't know for certain, but uh, might be playing a role. Yes? Do you know how that compares to other MSAs in Louisiana, like Baton Rouge East, Baton Rouge Parish, or New Orleans? Off the top of my head, no, but I have all the data. That'd be easy to do. The other thing I haven't looked at yet, which I just didn't have time, is this is only looking at median home prices. So another way to look at it is also look at, at rental prices to get a sense of, because not everybody's a homeowner, so you can get affordability that way as well. Um, I don't have that information yet, but I know where it is. Yes? Do you happen to have the breakdown between city versus pairs, so inner no. city versus? So it's the, the lowest level you can get these data nationwide are at a county or parish. But I did also do a comparison with uh, some other places. So I probably realized after I made this chart, I made Lafayette's line purple. And I never used purple. <laughs> I should have made it red. So that's a big faux pas on my part. But you can see, so Lafayette's the, I won't call it, it's the line with the triangles. And then I've also included there uh, Orleans Parish, which is kind of the brown line. And then the blue line there is East Baton Rouge Parish. So those are you know, three of the big parishes in, in Louisiana. Uh, we care, obviously, a lot about Lafayette. And then I've got some other ones to show you. This is Harris County, Texas. This is Houston, right? So home prices in Houston are one and a half to two times higher than the average income. We're 3.2. If we look at, say, Dallas, right? that's Dallas. Oh, sorry, Dallas was the bottom one. Dallas was red. Uh, Houston is the green line. And then here's another one. A gold, well, it's hard to see the gold one. That's Little Rock, Arkansas. That's Pulaski County. So you look at kind of the out-migration from Louisiana and Lafayette to places where they're going. Maybe this plays a role. I don't know. But those places are certainly a lot more affordable in terms of housing than what we are. And I think that's something to think about. <clears throat> Any questions on that? Shock everyone into silence. I can, I can get out the door pretty quick. So the last thing I want to talk about was Taylor Swift for a couple of different reasons. So I don't like to use this term, but I'm going to use this term. This is a, this is a perfect teachable moment. So I don't know if anybody saw this, these headlines last week in the news. Uh, they are absolutely ridiculous for two reasons. So reason number one, uh, the Federal Reserve never conducted any study about Taylor Swift. So I was vice president for the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland before coming here. And they do something called the Beige Book. And the Beige Book gets reported by every one of these 12 reserve banks. And they report anecdotes from businesses. And there was a business in Philadelphia, a hotel owner, who said, I saw an uptick in business around the time Taylor Swift was in Philadelphia. And that's the headline for Federal Reserve Study says. No, Federal Reserve Study didn't say. Some reporter doesn't actually understand what they're doing. But the second thing I want to talk about with Taylor Swift is just economic development uh, in a more general sense. So it all comes from the lens that you apply to what you're looking at. So, you know, apparently, I don't know a whole lot about Taylor Swift, but apparently she's quite the force and a lot of people travel to go to the shows and it's a big deal. But Taylor Swift is not driving growth in the US economy. I'm not saying anything bad about Taylor Swift. But think about it this way. Let's say you take Houston and a bunch of people from Lafayette want to go see Taylor Swift in Houston, pack up, go to Houston, get hotels, go out to dinner. Okay. That's money being spent in Houston that would have otherwise been spent here, okay? Economic development, to a large extent, you have to think about displacement. And so what Taylor Swift is doing is displacing economic activity. She's not generating new economic activity. She's just dictating where this activity takes place. And so I can give you another sense of thinking about that from a local perspective, and this is 
an actual conversation that I had with a uh, city manager in Norfolk, Virginia when I was a professor at Old Dominion University because he was touting the fact that Chick-fil-A was moving into town and all the tax revenue that Chick-fil-A was gonna generate. And I said, if Chick-fil-A comes into town and it does enough business that it survives, that's great because that means people really value what Chick-fil-A is providing and that's good, it's an amenity that people want. But I said, having Chick-fil-A come into town is not economic development. There's nobody driving from Richmond, Virginia to, old, to Norfolk to eat at Chick-fil-A. Nobody's flying in from out of town to eat at Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A is taking business away from other existing activity. It's just displacing, it's just moving it around. But it could be moving it around in a way that there are things that we like, maybe it's a restaurant that everybody likes, and that's great. But you've gotta be really careful thinking about regions and how regions grow, because often what happens is we would think moving a particular firm from one parish to another parish is a win. And all we've done is just reallocate where activity takes place. So when I tend to think about economic growth, I tend to think about things that are you know, increasing our income that's gonna increase our standard of living. So I mean, it's great that people love Taylor Swift, but she's not the reason the economy's booming. Sorry. Yes? Uh, I'll, I'll give you that for an answer. I, I mean, I don't know. I would say this. I mean, if you look at the data, there are two reasons primarily why people migrate. One is for family. The other is jobs. So I don't think you can do much on the family side, right? If somebody's leaving the region because of family, maybe, maybe a children leave and they want to go next to the grand be next to their grandkids, not much you can do there. Um, I think the job front is probably a key piece, but I also think, I'm like a middle-aged guy, I'm not the person, I would ask people who are the ones that are actually leaving. I mean, I, I hate to say I don't have a great policy recommendation for you, I don't, because I think, I'm not the person you wanna ask because I think the amenities that drew me here are not the amenities that are leading these people to leave. Um, I do think from a policy perspective, statewide, so I can't, I'll address that. And I, these are things I've said before. Uh, I think one of the things that's true about Louisiana compared to our competitors is we have a pretty burdensome regulatory regime through the state. It's very difficult to do things compared to say Texas or Arkansas. And I think Attracting firms here is challenging for that reason. So taking steps to ease that, I think would be a positive thing. I also think just from a tax perspective, last year, I think it was last year, the year before, the constitutional amendment on local sales tax, uh, we have the most burdensome sales tax compliance system in the country by a huge margin. It's not even close doing something to align ourselves more closely with our competitors would really help. But that didn't pass, so. Yep. Well, don't some companies you know, looking for a place to live also look for I'm sure they do. Um, I think, yeah, so that's, and that could be the 25 to 34, right? I mean, you do see a lot of changes in where people live when they have kids, especially reaching school age. Um, I think those are important factors. And I, I do know in Louisiana, I mean, I lived in, I've lived in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina, Arkansas. I mean, we underinvest in public education compared to our peers. So, yeah. Your uh, comment about the home prices as per uh, income, has Louisiana's income improved I used to do recruiting. It was very difficult to get somebody to move to Louisiana. And I told them, if you go across the state line, you're going to have to take the cut and Yeah, uh, I mean, we haven't, especially, you, you don't really want to compare us to Texas in just about anything. Um, <laughs> I, one thing I talked about last year, which I, is something I always talk about because I think it's important, and I think it's more just a shock factor. Um, so if you look at, growth from 2010 to just before the pandemic, so a 10-year period. And you look at 
all the states in the union, uh, Texas grew 40%. 40% of that 10-year period. There were two states whose economies actually shrank, and number 50 was Louisiana. The other one was Wyoming. So we, we shrank almost 4% at the time Texas grew 40%. So to me, I sort of look at it, as, and I say it as a shock factor, as you think about like a policy implication, I just think, hey, from a very basic level, you might think, whatever we're doing is not working. Time to try something else. And that also means that then in some, I think there's probably some very high probability that among you and your neighbors, some of you leave at some point, right? And so those are things that we don't want to do, and you've got to reverse that. And I think there are a lot of good people here doing a lot of interesting work trying to think about that attra uh, you know, attraction and retention piece. I think I don't know as much about that. I don't, that's not so much my area of research. Um, I think it's interesting to me. I, I think a lot about this is, hey, I'm kind of, trying to provide information so that we can try to make better decisions. I'm not saying I have the answers to what all these questions are, but I can at least shed some light on how, how what the issues might be. Let me get over here. Yeah, uh, no, I, uh, it's a good story. I think that's one of the reasons I started thinking about, well, me having just lived in seven different states, and now I've owned eight different houses. When I got here, I thought, holy, housing is a lot more expensive than I was expecting compared to some of these other places. And I had just never gotten around to digging into the numbers to kind of do an analysis of what it looked like. And, you know, I was surprised. I mean, it turns out, we're not, I didn't think Lafayette would be, I thought we would be below the national average in terms of affordability, but maybe close to the national average. I was really surprised to see that we were so much higher than the national average. Because I think often what you see is people will just be reporting home prices. Well, that doesn't tell you the other piece of the puzzle, which is, you know, you want to look at income as well. And so you think of New York City and say, well, the average house in New York City is very, very expensive. Well, their income is really high as well. And so when you start taking that into account, we, you know, don't look as favorable as we once did. So I too moved away um, from college, went to Atlanta, um, and relocated back home for a family and for a job opportunity. Um, and recently sat in another downtown lunch talking about the innovation that is coming to this area. Can you elaborate a little bit more? I hear a lot about innovation driving growth and a lot of what that looks for in our market, but can you provide yeah. some Sure. Uh, as much as I can. Yeah. So when, when I when I'm thinking about innovation driving growth, it, it, we think about what can we do. So a lot of economic activity exists to serve local people, right? So you know, for example, a good, bad example for me, but you go to get your hair cut. But what we're, what really is going to drive the region and, and increase our our incomes relative to our competitors is are we producing goods and services that those people are willing to pay for? So in, you know, historically for the state and even for the region, it was really a, you know, more of a commodity-based economy because you access to oil and gas in the Gulf. That's less advantageous to us now, which means you're really thinking about knowledge-driven economies. And if you look at the regions that grow the fastest and have grown the fastest over the last 20 years, it's the regions that have the high concentration of knowledge workers. And so to me, I think one of the things that's a little bit confusing, and maybe somebody could help me, you know, this is a nice place to live. I don't understand why it's not more attractive to people and, uh, because, you know, especially in a post-COVID world where you are increasingly going to be decoupled from where your job is in terms of your physical location, it seems like we would be a much more attractive place 
Uh, but we haven't seen that in bear itself out in numbers yet. But when I, so when I'm talking about just innovation, it's, you know, what are we creating that we can sell to people outside the region? And that's really what's, what's going to make our income grow relative to our competitors. Which happened after I got here. <laughs> no, I'm just, just kidding. So if we stop for a moment and think mm -hmm. about what that might mean, but are we messaging that in the right places? Because if we were, if we learned how to be better storytellers, what we do know is that once we get people here, they don't want to leave. So our work lies in getting the people here and also getting some of those 25 to 30 year olds Jefferson, the old Jefferson Street pub. 
uh, new event venue. Uh, it's hosted by the Jefferson. We're gonna have tons downtown food. Uh, mark your calendars. You can register on our website, Facebook, uh, etc. I think most of you got an email that had this in it um, yesterday. So really excited to have you all for that. We do have a lunch and run in July. Many folks had already pre-registered for it. Um, is that July or September? I'm messing up, y'all. Where's my team helping? September, thank you. We have one coming up in September, too. If you got that, that member email from us yesterday, that's at the assessor's office. Uh, if you've already registered, you're still registered, unless you tell us different. Um, but we would love to see everyone come check out the assessor's new office on Vermillion Street. So lots of awesome programming to come. Uh, downtown Live's kicking off with a special edition at the end of August, and then we'll be programming Downtown Live in September. So we hope to see you all at a downtown event soon. Thank you again to Key Miller, the Downtown Convention Center, um, and all of our partners. Um, Key Miller has some great swag, like chargers for your phone and stuff at that table uh, right when you're going to walk out. So make sure to thank them for their participation today. We hope to see you soon. And uh, Dr. Wagner, thank you again for all the energy you always put into this mid-year update for us.